uh, verses 60 through 65. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are in spirit, and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe, and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. Thank you, Esteban. <laughs> It's another great day in sunny Arizona. <laughs> we'll send Kim back to the snow and the rest of us will just enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs> lots of good things that are coming up and lots of good things that are happening here and it's a great thing to be able to be with you all and just to be able to enjoy God's blessings together. Uh, this title is maybe my favorite. My favorite question is, you know, what if? And for all of those who are watching football, that's your question, right? What if? Because there's, there's something about it that says, what if this could happen? And you're going to cheer and you're going to believe and you're going to hope and you're going to trust and they will come through for you, I know, right? Do you guys know? Okay, you guys aren't much of a believer here, are you? It sounds like there's a lot of, a lot of doubters out here. So uh, we'll see what happens. You know, you have to believe in the what if. Because that's where it all begins. That's where it all starts. For everyone looking at elections this year, what if, right? In fact, that's really a core for everything in your life. What if this could happen? What if? That's such a powerful phrase because it just starts your whole thinking process into here's what God's able to do. Because before we can declare the what is, you have to ask the what if. If you look at the passage in John chapter 6, the passage is about Jesus after he's healed the, or after he's fed the 5,000. And so as he's fed the 5,000, then discussion ensues about, you know, well, why don't you do this again? And he's trying to say, no, I was trying to teach you something about that your real life is sustained by God and that I can give you bread and that God has given you bread out of heaven. And that I'm the bread that God's given you out of heaven. And they're kind of wavering on this whole thing. And the fact that God then really is the one who sustains your life and he switches to spiritual terms and mixes the two. And he says, so really, I'm the one God's giving to you. So you should eat my flesh. You should drink my blood. You should take me into your life and at that point they look at him and go huh this is just a little bit too much I don't think we quite understand what you're saying I don't think we quite know where you're going I think we're about done and, and so they give up why did they give up well because they hit a point at which we don't understand we, we don't think you've got something to say, and they don't know how to ask the what if. Jesus does it for them, right? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? Well, that's kind of an odd question. That has nothing to do with eating flesh or drinking blood or any of the things they've been talking about. So why would he ask that kind of a question? Is it a test question? Is it a review question? Did you not understand what if... No, it's not any of those, is it? It's a question that is completely different from any of the things that they've been seeing. It's a question that asks, can you believe anything? Do you have any faith? What if you could see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? 
And in order to answer that question, you have to first of all believe Jesus came from God, that Jesus was once in heaven, that he's come down to earth from there, that now in some manner form he is going to be able to go back to heaven. And if he's able to go back to heaven, then what does that mean for us? That's his real question. Of course, we understand it because we've read kind of the end of the book. They haven't seen that part yet. But Jesus is going to die on a cross. Jesus is going to ascend back to God, back to the right hand of the throne of God, exactly where he was before. And the question is still, what are you going to do with that? What if he could do that then? And we're like, nice. No, no, no. What if you could do that? You've got to follow the what if. Right? What if we could ascend with him? What if we could be resurrected with him? What if we could be in heaven with God? And that's really what he's trying to get them to see. But, you know, they get whole lost on the, all the other details and eat flesh, drink blood. Ugh. This sounds bad. This sounds like cannibal. We don't think this way. We don't believe in this stuff anymore. And so they give up. They don't know what to do with that whole part of it. And so they're not even looking at the way it is. The question is designed as a faith test. That would mean that you believe in the Son of God. He looks at his disciples and then goes, well, are, are you going to walk away too? And they go, well, where else would we go? I mean, you have the words of eternal life. And their what if has been answered in a whole different way, isn't it? I'm not sure they understood any better. I'm not sure they really grasped what it was. But we understand you are something different. You are something special. We understand that, you know what, if, if you can show us that, great. And it's amazing that Jesus puts this part in here. And I want to show you this thing as you look at how it unfolds throughout Scripture. What if you could see the Son of Man ascending where he was before. So tell me, where do your ideas start? The first thing you see, the first thing you wake up in the morning, you're about to come to church, and you're thinking, what if, what if it's a great day? What if it's just an amazing Sunday? What if, well, that's not where most of us go. Most people start with, uh, what if there's a flood? Right? What if something bad happens? And we always go for that negative. And you can go either positive or negative. But you go, well, what if there's a snowstorm? Well, not here. It would be snow that melted now. There's a flood. So, you know, what if there's a flood? What if there's a fire? What if something goes wrong? What if the car breaks down in Miami? It was, what if there's a hurricane? I mean, that was always the possibility. And it comes along and it wipes out everything. And we always go for that negative side. What if the car doesn't make it? What if I have a flat tire? What if I don't feel good? What if, what if? And we can do so much damage with all the what if negatives that it just seems to not be helpful for us at all. But what if God is real? What if heaven is real? And what if he really wants us to be there? What if you could make someone feel better today? Would that be a good day? What if we could fly? What if lunch is going to be fantastic? What if, and there's all kinds of things. What if your kids actually behave today? Well, I know, let's not get too far, but this is what makes our future. It's what determines everything. We either see things as worth the risk, or we hide and say, no, let's just try not to do too much damage today. What if God was able to do something? And I think that's where Jesus brings on that challenge to his disciples. It's the difference in the people who believe and the people who are just scared. 
And Jesus begins to challenge that in a whole lot of different ways. Sometimes as you look at scripture, it's a statement for our agreement, and that's all it is. Sometimes it's a question that if we know, and sometimes do you know how? And sometimes it's asking about is it possible? And it gets phrased two different ways. What if we could, or the other side, you don't think we could do this, do you? Aren't those the same question? They are. Just one's positive, one's negative. And if you always say, well, I don't know that we could, or you don't think we could, and if they say yes, then you go, oh, well, okay, let's do it. But you've already set it up to be a no answer, so you're thinking, well, it's not going to be true. I think we see some of those in several different places. One is in Nicodemus. If you turn to John chapter 3 with me, Jesus has been teaching a lot of different things. Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and as he comes to Jesus, he begins saying to him, I think you're a teacher sent from God. But he doesn't understand everything. He doesn't know everything. He's kind of being careful about all of this. He's coming to him at night. He knows his position, and he's trying to be careful about it all. And he comes to Nicodemus, and Jesus starts talking about this whole idea about born again. You have to be born again. You have to be born of water and the Spirit. And Nicodemus is getting a little bit confused. And so, in verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. We bear witness to what we have seen. But you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And so Nicodemus is confused. He's like, how can these things be? I don't understand. Well, you know, and he's thinking, born again, uh, this sounds kind of bad for a physical birth process. I'm a lot bigger now, and it's just not a, not a pleasant picture. To, it wasn't even that pleasant the first time, if you think about it. But uh, now it's even worse. And so he's trying to say, I don't understand what you're saying. And Jesus does that over and over and over again to people. Why would he do that? Why would he say something they wouldn't understand? Well, it's for one reason. I want you to ask, what if? And Nicodemus is just like, I don't really get this. I don't quite understand. How can these things be Jesus has introduced some new concepts that he's never heard of before. And Jesus says, what if I told you heavenly things? I told you earthly things. What if I told you heavenly things? Would you, isn't that why you came, Nicodemus? You came to see a teacher of the Jews. You came to see a man of God. You came to see somebody who has some understanding beyond what you really can grasp. What if I showed you heavenly things? What if I've only showed you earthly things? What if I, and it's really amazing, isn't it? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. What? Why throw that phrase in there? It's the what if. What if you saw the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It's the same subject. And he puts it in again in this passage to be able to say, what if you saw this? What if you saw me going back to heaven? Wouldn't that mean I'm the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come from heaven so that now you are able to have this Messiah who brings you back, who brings you deliverance. And so he says, no one's ascended to heaven except Jesus. 
And he is going to do that. He's indicating, I am going to be the one from heaven and I will be going back there. And then he brings up the whole thing about Moses and the serpent in the wilderness and that Moses lifted up the serpent and Jesus in a very short two sentences has given him some incredible insight into some things that he probably isn't going to get here. But I think he thinks about it enough. He knows enough law And so he goes about this Moses and the serpent in the wilderness. Well, the reason Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness is because all the people had sinned. They had all, you know, been caught in their sin and they were all dying. And so Moses lifts up the serpent in the wilderness. God had sent a bunch of snakes among them. So he puts this one brass serpent, lifts it up, and anybody who looks on this serpent won't die really that's the cure I mean isn't that a what if you almost have to do that what's the correlation between that thing and the one that just bit me how is there going to be anything that because I want you to think what if I looked at what was risen up and could live And God says, I'm drawing this huge mural for you. What if you could see a Savior on a cross who was lifted up and live? What if in all your sinfulness with snakes biting you, you could look up at a serpent on a cross or a Savior on a cross and you could live? Do you get it yet, Nicodemus? And I think he's kind of like, no, not really. But Jesus does that for us, doesn't he? He says, let's just let it sit for a while. And we don't have the rest of the conversation about how it ends. I'm sure he goes out scratching his head trying to figure this whole thing out. But it is a type for the cross of Jesus. And he's saying, I will be lifted up. I will be ascending back to my Father where I have come from. I am the Messiah. It is very much a Messiah statement that he's trying to make here because the Savior is going to die on a cross for you. We do this with fear or faith. The Pharisees were the ones who had the fear. And that's kind of how they approach life. What if we do something wrong and God isn't happy? And I think a lot of Christians almost approach God that way. What if we sinned? What if we messed up? What if we do something that's wrong? What if we make a mistake and let's try and cover every base and let's try and not do anything wrong and let's make sure that we don't do anything that's going to be bad. And the translation of that is, let's not do anything. That's not faith. Because their what-ifs are all about this negative. We might mess up. We might do something terrible. It might be awful. God might destroy us. And yeah, he might. If you don't use the talent he gave you, if a few other things like that, if you don't invest in God, if you don't believe Those are the things that he says makes all the difference. So it's that what if that he's trying to bring us to. It's that what if. The disciples answer it a different way. Disciples is what if you believed in this. Because they're not the guys who've had the law and understood it all. Peter's is what if I could walk on water. Isn't that where he was? He sees Jesus out there. And he sees him walking on water and he's sitting in a boat and Jesus is making better time than he is. And he goes, what if? If it's really you, Jesus, let me come. He says, come on. He says, I tried to teach you that in the beginning. If I can do it, you can do it. So that's a parallel. You need to ask, what if I could do what Jesus did? What if I could follow him enough to do exactly what he did? And he says, okay, get out of the boat. Come on. And it works for a little while until that whole doubt thing comes in. And he starts, what if I drowned? What if I sink? What if that wave crushes me? And you get all the negative what ifs coming in. And sure enough, it doesn't work anymore. We have to see the faith side of this whole thing. And I think it makes an incredible difference. What if you could fly? Well, it's nice for the bird. He's got wings. He's got feathers, right? 
everybody knows we can't fly, right? It's not possible. Until somebody said, what if? And we've been saying, what if? Right, we're going to make airplanes out of metal. Are you kidding me? Why don't we make them out of feathers? I mean, you don't make an airplane out of metal. That's too heavy. How can you ever get it to lift? Yeah, what if we crash? That's always the biggest what if. What if we could fly? What if we could float? What if... I would love to try this, but I'd drown myself, I know. Because <laughs> I wouldn't go up, I'd go down, and that's, that's my what if speaking, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but what if? These have just been invented recently. These are brand new. It's still a question for me whether they really got this hover car out there or not. I think the prototype's been developed and you can watch it go, but it's certainly not in production yet. Are you going to drive one? What if your car could fly home? It's already got protection all around it, right? It stops itself. It beeps when somebody's on the side. What if we could... Do you realize we're answering that what if all the time? What if we use that as Christians to further our faith, to further what God does in this world? What if it was about our faith? Peter says, I believe I can walk on water. What if you let your nets down on the other side? Would you catch any fish? His first answer was, well, what if we don't? But what if we do? What if you could heal a lame man who's been sitting at the temple gate for years and nobody else has been able to? What if you could baptize 3,000 people in one day? Yeah, some questions are just ridiculous, aren't they? Until they happen. We believe Jesus could. We believe other people could. We're just not so sure we could but with God's power I think all of that is possible we just got to ask the what if one last example that I think we get trained for this negative thing and where we can't see it we can't understand it we can't know is in John chapter 1 and verse 45 Philip's already been called by Jesus and he goes to find Nathaniel and Nathaniel is uh, one of those scholars who understands very much about Messiah. They've been looking for him. They try to understand. Here's what's going on in, uh, in uh, John 1, 45. So Philip found Nathaniel, and he said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law, also the prophets, wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and he said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. What an incredible thing he's talking about. He already knows the Messiah is not going to come from Nazareth. And so that's his objection. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. You know, I know who you're talking about, Jesus of Nazareth, and he can't be it because he's already been disproven because he's from Nazareth. And we do that to ourselves, don't we? We convince ourselves this can't be true because after all, this scripture says, and the scripture does say, no, it's going to be out of Bethlehem, so what's the problem? The problem's our view of our life. It isn't a problem with scripture. 
But sometimes the way we have applied Scripture might limit what we are able to do. We think it can only be done one way. And God is trying to say, you know what, there might be some other things. What if? Not to go against Scripture whatsoever at all. But what if there was another way? What if there was something else? And so he says, well, just come and look. And he goes, okay, I'll come and look. And Jesus says to him, I know you. You're honest and you don't cheat. And he goes, how do you know that? And he goes, I saw you under the fig tree. And it all of a sudden clicks. He can't see me under the fig tree. He can't know that. He can't understand all of this. He can't know me unless, what if he was the son of God? And he's left with the answer to that what if, if obviously he is the son of God. And so here he comes down to it and he says, then you're the king of Israel. Yeah. He's not arguing with him and he says, this is amazing, this is grace. As you think that's great? I've got bigger stuff. You know this whole ascending, descending thing? This is the third time, you realize? Jesus seems to use this example a lot. What if you saw the Son of Man ascending where he was? But he puts a new spin on it. What if you saw angels on the Son of Man going back and forth? What if Jesus is the link between heaven and earth and all communication and all ambassadors and everything depend on Jesus Christ? And what if God has an infinite great connection with us because he has messengers that are here and he has those through Jesus Christ. What if? And he says, you're going to see it. Wow. <laughs> okay. Because he's going to see Jesus die on a cross. And he's going to see that connection made between heaven and earth. And he's going to hear Peter talk about what if your sins could be forgiven because Jesus, the Messiah, has died on a cross, has been buried in a tomb, and has ascended back to the right hand of the throne of God? What does that mean for you? And Nathaniel's like, then he's Messiah. And if he's Messiah, I believe I could do it too. What if I could sit in heaven with him? And that's all about belief. That's all what it is. Because you answer the what if. Jesus descended from heaven and he has ascended back. It took a cross to make this connection. It took a cross to be able to say that. But three stories tell the same thing every time. In case you can't see the small print, I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love where feeling is not. And I believe in God even when he is silent. What if you could be saved? What if your sins could be forgiven? What if you could have 400 new friends? What if you could get along with everybody? I know that's kind of a stretch, but what if every single encounter you run into is going to be a matter of grace and every single person that you meet you're going to love, whether they love you or not, that's a whole other thing, that's up to them. But what if you could do that? Because God gives you the tools to accomplish that. What if you could be at the right hand of the throne of God with the Savior in heaven. Can you believe that one? Boy, what an incredible opportunity. What if it could happen just as simply as you saying, I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm willing to repent and I'm willing to confess my sins. What if your sins could be washed away simply by being baptized into Christ because you're buried with him and that just takes care of all of it and it makes a new covenant. What if? Can you believe that? It is real. 
And it is possible. And maybe you need that today. We want to give you that opportunity to cash in on the what if. And all the rest of this week, I want you to be asking what if. What if God, man, it opens up new possibilities. What if about your life? Can God do something there? Can we pray for you? Come while we stand and sing.